Steve Moran here with Senior Living Foresight, and I am just a couple days off of attending the SMASH conference, the, the Senior Living Marketing Conference in Las Vegas. And the last keynote of the day was really, really remarkable. David Stewart, who founded the website Aegis, uh, where he is looking at what it means to grow older in today's world. I'm actually going to let David talk a little bit more about that. So there I asked him if I could do an interview, because I think he has some amazing insights um, into, that, into the process of aging, where people today who are growing older, um, uh, how they're looking at life and uh, what, what maybe we could do in our senior living space to really attract those people and create something that's just marvelous and wonderful. So David, let's start a little bit with your background. Oh, and one other thing I just wanna add, because this, this is the part that sort of is gonna lead the story as you'll see when it's in print, is that he did at least part, he did part of his research on market research on Tinder. So we, I'm gonna ask him to tell that story as well. But David, why don't you ta start by telling me a little bit about uh, what Aegis is and how you came about to start it and where your passion is. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Aegis, um, Aegis is a number of things. Um, we're a publisher, we're a media company. Uh, we publish a site called Aegis and you can find us at weareagis.com. We publish a newsletter every Thursday, which is gorgeous and everyone should um, uh, subscribe to that. It's free and we do social and it's, in addition to this, we work with a lot of brands um, and we help them to understand people like myself. I'm 60 um, and I live in a very different way than my mom did when she was 60. Uh, and uh, a lot of the big brands find that a little confusing. We help them out with strategy. We do a ton of research. We do quant, qual studies, uh, and we're very good at producing content. I come out of 35 years at the top levels of commercial photography and a lot of the people on the team are similarly accomplished. So talk to me a little bit about how you came to start this uh, uh, website. It's really this, comp this, this organization because to call it just a website really doesn't do it justice. Uh, yeah, indeed. Um, I'm still look looking for that five word elevator pitch of what we do. Yep. Um, and really what we are, we're you know, we're, the, we're like a 360 ecosystem around people who are living the way we do, um, which is a very specific thing. We pick a very tight lane. Um, it's not, we're not talking about everyone. Uh, the way we began was that in my career as a photographer, I became aware that I was getting older, my friends are getting older, and the people I'm taking pictures of are not getting older. And I thought, well, that's really curious. Uh, and then we had an occasion where we did a big campaign and we found out that all the people who were the subjects of the campaign who were using the product didn't buy the product. It was purchased by their parents. And I thought, that's unusual. Why are we speaking to the people who are not purchasing the product? I understand they're part of the decision making process, but what's up with that? And so we investigated a lot of that and to figure out exactly driving that, why that is, and, you know, the basically advertising and marketing, um, you know, the average age there of an art director is about 30. Uh, and I believe the stats are, I want to say it's 6% of people who work in advertising and marketing are over 50 and something like 40% of the population. So you can see a bit of a mismatch there. Uh, and then we thought, well, you know, let's further investigate here. What's, what's going on with this population? What's different about myself and the way I live, all my friends, the way my mom lived? And further, what's different? What are the values that people like in my cohort have versus people in these other tribes? Because as, as people age, and this is what confounds the, the marketing people, is that they age very differently. And we, we essentially age into these tribes based on... Um, you know, various different, our, our health, our geography, our education, and really, most importantly, Steve, how do we see ourselves in the future? Do we see ourselves at 50 as only being halfway through life, or do we see ourselves at 50 as the game's just about over? Yeah, I, that's really a remarkable thing to me. I, I have a number of friends that I went to high school and college with 
who who are who have retired or are about to retire. And I'm a little bit older than you. I'll turn 65 in a few months. And I um, I, I can't I can't in the foreseeable future imagine retiring. I have no idea what I would do with my time. I love what I do every day. I'm making a difference in the world. And I realized that they're, they're doing this getting older thing so much differently than I am that, that, you know, we, what do we have in common? We were born about the same time and maybe not really very much else. And so that, I, that really resonates with me. So there are two things that you talked about that I, I really want to touch bases with because I think they're so relevant to the senior living industry. But first, let's talk about Tinder and market research. <laughs> Everybody loves, anytime you say, you know, whenever I mention the word Tinder in a business meeting, I have everybody's full attention. Like it's gonna be the, the phones headline, are down. I you. <laughs> so, you know, what, what we did was um, in, in the beginning, one of the main things about people our age that's most confounding is what do they look like? Because we're, you know, we're just swimming in all this imagery that says that we look like something that we aren't which makes us all feel like we're oddities, right? Like we're not matching up. And so uh, what happened was my, my partners were, you know, they said to me, you're a, you're a great photographer. Why don't you go take a bunch of pictures of these people and then we can have a library and we'll know what this looks like because that's going to be very important. I thought, okay, I can do that. I need to go somewhere where these people are. So the first mistake I made is I've externalized this judgment. I'm thinking I'm not one of them. People I know are not one of them. There's something other because that's what I've been presented with. So I go, I live in California, I live in Los Angeles, and I went out into the desert to a golf community and I said, I'll find them here. And I, I was there like 15 seconds, Steve, and I thought, oh my God, you idiot. Uh, you're like, you're a sophisticated visual marketing professional and you, you swallowed the whole thing. Um, it's, they, they're not there. Like I, I live in a building in downtown Los Angeles. It's a converted factory building. There is no indigenous population here. People don't grow up here. And you know, probably 75% of my building is over 50. And I've, I've got a guy who's my neighbor who fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Like, wow, why? Yeah, um, uh, you know, why, what, what's up? There's my tribe. So, so I came back and I said, okay, I'm gonna photograph these people. I'm gonna work really hard, but I realized if I, I'm really uh, vigilant on this. I can maybe do three a day. It's going to take me a year. I need something faster. So what I did is I made a fake profile on Tinder and I go on Tinder and Tinder is a remarkable data source. Uh, and you know, the upper age limit on Tinder is 45, it's 45 and above. And I became one of the world's foremost experts on this. I never, never swipe right, always swipe left. And I would screen shoot people. And I, have screenshots of an excess of 4,000 people. And wow. what's in it? Yeah, I mean, it took me a month. That's all I did was just that. And I became an expert on it. And the nice thing about Tinder is you pay them, what I think it's like 38 bucks, you move your geolocator. So the way Tinder works is it'll start with where you are and it kind of goes out. Um, so I live in downtown Los Angeles, it'll go out and, you know, to wherever the outskirts of that is. And when that doesn't seem right anymore, I just, it's like, okay, I'm going to the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I'm going to go to Tribeca. I'm going to go to London. I'm going to go to Paris. I went like all over the world and I accumulated all of these photographs. And you know, the interesting thing about Tinder is, yeah, they're going to lie about their age, whatever. It doesn't matter. They're not going to lie about all the stuff that they do because that's going to get them into real trouble when they go on a date. So that immediately gave us this board of pictures. And the, whenever I give a presentation, the, you know, what I do is I say, uh, I said, well, let's see, what does old look like? And old is such a loaded word. We say, okay, let's, let's look at old. And so we pull up a slide of a Google image search of the word old, and it looks like all the sort of typical pharma stuff that you see. And then the next slide, I said, well, maybe we're asking the wrong question. What does over 50 look like? Basically the same thing. And I said, well, actually that's not it. It looks like this. And then I pull up some slides that are screenshots off of Tinder. And that really says it in a way that words can't. That's how we began. That's the beginning of our research. That's cool. So what was the, what was the oldest 
um, self-reported age you found on Tinder? 109. She was lying. Uh, but they don't usually lie that way, but I guess that makes sense, right? We got some people's attention. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I actually kind of like, I, you know, I think I'd like somebody who'd lie and say they were 109. Um, that's pretty yeah. good. That is pretty good. Okay, so I want to actually dig a little, that, that was really fun, but I want to dig a little bit into something that might actually help senior living operators uh, and owners sort of figure out their audience better. We know that today only about 10 percent of the age and income qualified people and we look at mostly because of what data is available 75 plus and typical is more likely 80 moves in although i think there may be opportunity to serve people like that um but we only we know only about 10 percent of the people who are age and income qualified choose senior living and many of those choose those because they feel like they don't have any other choices they're forced into it because of of physical or mental limitations. But there were two things that you talked about in your keynote that, that really, really hit home to me. The first was that people are, those old people, people our age, uh, because see, even I look at it this way, right? But people our age are terrified uh, of losing relevance. And I guarantee you that I'm there, that, that fits my profile. And, and the second thing is that, um, is that they want to live the best life that they can live. Be the, I think the, the term you used was they want to be the best me. And um, I'd like to just have you talk a little bit about what that means and maybe give me your thoughts about what that might mean to the senior living industry. Uh, well, the relevance uh, point comes from, we do a lot of quant surveys. Um, and we, you know, as part of the survey, we ask people, what's scary? You know, what's the thing that scares you the most? And they're not scared of dying. I mean, of course they're scared of dying, but they're even more scared of being marginalized and becoming irrelevant. Um, and I think that that is something that perhaps is different. Like the, the sort of people that we're talking to are, I want to say roughly 50 to late 60s. So it's a baby boomer. Which is, which is different than the greatest generation. And you know, something that I, that I talked about in, uh, at Smash is that for my mom, who's 89, she's used to the idea of settling. And for her, like a win is staying alive, um, having three meals a day, you know, come out of the depression, the wars, that's a win. For us, it's a lot more. So in, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, we were taught we could choose who we wanted to be. We could choose the path that we wanted to take. It wasn't prescribed. We didn't have to do something. And this idea of optionality, which is essentially how can I become the best version of myself, is something that is really drives people. And I think that the reason, you know, part of the way that's manifest is this idea of having impact. And it relates to this idea of relevance. So it, it's tied in the best version of me can have the greatest impact and the greatest relevance. Yeah, I, I, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess that when you were talking about the best me, um, I, during your keynote, I got my smartphone out and I did this little Google search and I put in, uh, I forget I put it either senior living, I think I put assisted living and the best me in there. And I, 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 frankly, I was, I was pretty discouraged that I yeah. didn't get, you, you'd think you'd get something, and I didn't get anything. And um, to me, that may be <laughs> the biggest lesson that I worry that that, that in fact what senior living does is, is that it accelerates um, uh, Marginalization. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So like the stat that you said, 10% of people go. And the only reason they're going is because they have to. It's not because they're like, wow, I'd really love to go there because it's this awesome thing. I can be a better version of myself. I can continue to accelerate in my growth. That's not the language. It's more, I, keep me alive. Um, I'm going to settle 
for this kind of lower thing. I don't really need much more. You know, give me the mahjong and I'll be all right. Um, who do you know that's going to sign up for that? Like that's that's crazy. Warehousing. That's just you're you're not addressing people's primary need, which is this idea of become the best version of themselves. How can you how can you help them with that? Then all of a sudden you're going to start to get people. And you know what I said in my talk was this idea of moving from required to requested. Those 10% of people who are moving in, it is required. It's not because they want to go. It's not because they think this is going to be like, oh, um, awesome, I can be this better version. I can have more impact out in the world. No, that's not, that's not what's happening. And I, I think that that is the, I, I mean, I know because we work with some people who are about to very much disrupt this space, that's going to be the messaging. And they're moving towards a customer that's not 85, but that's 58, 60, 65. Um, because targeting on that and community and helping each other and actualizing these sort of things versus and a place where people want to be versus where they are required to be. I, I think today the only really good example uh, of um, being the best me that exists in sort of the aging um, uh, living space is probably Jimmy Buffett's latitude. And, and, <laughs> and, and they've got this huge waiting list. And I, I think, so my, my father is, is, will be 91 um, in just a couple of months. And he lives at home. He's certainly got some physical uh, frailties. His hard of hearing and his balance has gone down. But he's still driving. He's reading. He's thinking. He's contributing. Um, and I, I, I have just an impossible um, picture of him moving into the senior living world as it exists today. But I also know that he's super social and that the right senior living community where he could continue to be the best me would be likely very, very appealing to him and to his wife. So um, this is just such an important conversation. Um, and yet the other part of it is the stigma part. Uh, I have a, a guy by the name of Jack Cumming who's one of my most trusted advisors. He's 82, 83. He lives in a senior living community, a CCRC, um, in, in your neck of the woods down in, in Carlsbad. And uh, he was a retired actuary. He produces content for me. He's you know, one of the trusted people I go to when I need advice. And his biggest frustration is, is that when he tells people he lives in a senior living community, um, he's immediately put in this bucket of irrelevancy. Any thoughts about how, we, how the industry creates that, changes that image? Yeah, uh, you need to reframe the entire thing into something aspirational rather than something that's like based on a hospital. So like move the model away from the hospital and move it to Soho House. Like make it something that people want to go to, that it's cool and that you've earned the right to be there versus, I, you know, I need this thing. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that you know, there is a need for the hospital-based system because there are a great deal of people who they have memory issues, they have physical issues, and this is important. And I, and I at no time do I mean to disparage that. Uh, but I do think that the whole, the imagery, the language, everything that's set about, you know, when you say senior living facility or senior living um, anything. I'm just like, I just check out like, yeah, whatever, you know, you're, I'm, I'm just thinking you're over, like whatever you used to be, you're over. Um, so, you know, that needs to change. And I think that that is really what we do at Aegis is something quite simple that other people seem to have tremendous difficulty with, which We've reframed people our, our age as being aspirational. There aren't any role models. There are no North Stars. I mean, outside of a couple of people, you got like, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and you got like a few people out there, but it's pretty sparse. 
Um, it's mostly we are seen as a problem. We are seen as a burden. We are seen as somebody who has something wrong with them, somebody who's out of touch. There's a great deal of comedy that's done at our expense. Um, and it's untrue. And I, I think that in the senior living space, the, you know, what I would like to see is this idea of uh, making it, it, a bit of exclusivity going on here and saying like, um, and I'm not saying so much in, you know, for instance, if you want to go into a co-op in New York City, you got to go in front of a co-op board and they say you can come in or you can. Uh, you know, there's an element of exclusivity there. There's if you you can't just decide no matter how much money you've got, you can't just walk up to Soho House and say, I'd like to join today. They say, no, you need two members to nominate you and then we will consider you. Now, there's a bunch of I mean, a lot of it is a lot of hooey, but it's a very different paradigm than saying, you know, the way it is now, which is um, not, it's not very aspirational. No, I, I, think it's, I think it's not aspirational at all. And I find myself believing that we could create an aspirational model, even for, or maybe especially for people who have both significant physical and cognitive uh, decline that but instead what we we have what we do is really what you described is like well they've got that decline and maybe five percent decline maybe ten percent decline maybe a fifteen percent physical and a eight uh, percent cognitive sort of feels like normal but after that it's it's all over and it just becomes warehousing but why couldn't we create a model that that even if even if um, my dementia was you know half the time I didn't know my loved ones that it could still be aspirational to be the best me. Um, so I don't know. Is that unrealistic? No, I don't think so. I think it's it's really changing the paradigm. It's 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 changing this uh, the whole thinking from. It's essentially the hospital model to something else. Um, partially hospitality, but partially education. I think there's like, just thinking about not how can we keep you alive today, but how can we make you really the best version of you today? How can we help you become whatever the best version of you is? And that's really up to, it's very different from, I mean, there, I'm sure there are people out there that, would, that aspire to be the world's best Mahjong players. Awesome. So, like, have at it. You know, maybe you want to be the best whatever, or maybe it's, you know, you aspire to really help people understand something, or you aspire to discover something, or whatever it is. Um, I, there's just so much opportunity there, and it's just, you know, we're still, um, like, Dan Hudson, um, uh, gave me the phrase, the, um, the cruise ship in the desert model, which is just all about like bells, whistles, and entertainment. Uh, yeah, okay, some people are always going to want that, but there's a lot of other people who want a lot more than that. Yeah, well, I've, I've talked a lot about the cruise ship model, and if I came to you and said, hey, I'm going to give you a ticket for free to Sanborn or one of the higher – one of the real high-end cruise ships, right? You'd go, oh yeah, that'd be great. But if I told you you could never get off again, yeah. you, you would hate that. You, you'd, no. you'd say no thanks. Um, and interestingly, I was on a cruise in the Caribbean uh, last Thanksgiving, and uh, I met one of those hundred or so people who actually live full-time on, on cruise ships. And I, I have to tell you, what a miserable human being. She wasn't happy. She was demanding. And I thought, uh, if this is, I, you know, I don't know whether the cruise ship created that or because she's that way, she loves the cruise ship. But I thought, boy, that's not me and that's not anybody else I know. And I guess that's why there are only 100 people who do it. But um, so I want to ask you one more question. Uh, it's it's yeah. a question I actually asked you at the conference. And so maybe you've had a chance to think about it a little bit more, maybe not. But it's a question I like to ask, particularly people who are outside the industry. And that's that I want you to imagine that you're 85 or 90 
and you're thinking that maybe this senior living thing might not be might be the right thing for you what would that senior living community need to look like to for you to say oh i can hardly wait to get in there first of all it wouldn't be a senior living community it would be filled with people of all ages i don't want to be around a lot of people like me it's boring i need more information i need to be connected to the culture i need to know what's going on um, I do not need to be isolated somewhere. I need to be as connected um, to stay as relevant and as impactful as I can. Uh, I think that this, uh, um, you know, perhaps at that point I need some sort of physical help. Okay, so what? Um, you know, that should not really be an issue. Um, I think that uh, I may have some hopefully not too many cognitive issues um, and that whatever sort of I think that the modality of the place again has to be not about putting me in a place where I can be sort of safe and just expire at some point I don't want to be safe like I don't need this mediation between me and the world I'm pretty competent you know I'm, and please don't do that. Like, I want to know, I've got a, I've got a friend, um, Cynthia Adler. Cynthia Adler is 84. She moved to Manhattan when she was 79 um, from living in rural Pennsylvania because she wanted to live across from Lincoln Center because she wanted to be connected. And the highlight of her day is riding the New York City subway because she loves seeing all the stuff and meeting all the people. And she has now become at, you know, the age of 84, one of the world's, the world's foremost authorities on street breakdancing. Like she knows all the people, she knows all their names. She's totally hooked into this. Like, I want that. That, I love that. I love that. And I'm gonna segue back to your site. So those are the kinds of stories that I'll find at, at your website, Aegis, right? That's right. And uh, so we'll put the link in, in the article. Uh, I would recommend it. Uh, I'm on the, the, the news list. I don't remember exactly when I signed up, but I've been on for a while. Um, wonderful you. stories and beautiful, beautiful photography. Are you taking most of the pictures? Less and less, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, I would guess that's probably true. Um, I just, um, there's only one of me. And there's a lot of demands on me, so yep. I do what I can. It's the, it's the most fun and easiest part of my job. Perfect. Well, David, thank you so much. This has been okay. an amazing conversation. Uh, when I have conversations like this, I walk away um, with, we're really with my heart singing because I believe that people like you can help radically reform make senior living better and the more people we have who are helping us think outside the box the the better the whole sector gets and so i just i'm so grateful for your being willing to uh spend the time at smash and uh, spend the time with me here uh let me talk to you and record this so again thank you Steve thank you so much my pleasure